Welcome to the Selling in the Motor Trade podcast in association with Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice tips and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bogert. Now, some of you probably already know me as Skippy. I want to start by saying thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Firstly, again, we just want to say thank you to everyone who has been sharing this podcast with their work colleagues, uh, people that they know, uh, getting this out to as many people as we can. We really do appreciate it. And the growth of this podcast is just going from strength to strength. Something we started in the very first lockdown uh, has amazed us. We've gone over 100 episodes now, and we're getting so many comments. So please, again, um, take the time to comment. We really do appreciate it. We read it. We come back to people as well. Um, so we do appreciate it. Now, this episode, I'm with Darren Bedford and Andrew Clark. And we've just gone through the Christmas period. And what's nice through the Christmas period is we've got lots of time to sit down, reflect, and think about the business. I'm sure you've been doing the same thing. We often say at Simcoe Training, it's nice to have time to work on the business, not in the business. And it's part of that. We've been looking at what's happening in the future. Where's the motor trade going? Used car stock. What's going to happen there? But we got to talking about the disruptors out there. Now, if you listen to this down the track, this is actually coming out the first week of January, 2023. And Kazoo, there was a, um, a, a, a warning, I think is the right word, come out about from Car Dealer Magazine this morning about Kazoo and going through a bit of trouble. So when you listen to this, we don't know if they're still operating or not. Uh, time will tell. But I want to start this conversation off with Andrew and Darren with a question. These disruptors, the Cavanas in America, the Kazoos, the cinches of the world, are their days done? Is there a place for them? Andrew, what are your views on these disruptors? Uh, I've got to say, I think if you look back at it, during the COVID era, when people had to go online, the disruptors really came into the fore, didn't they? they? They'd started their business model prior to COVID, mm -hmm. and people were forced to go down that line. I still think there's room in the market for them, but I think they've got to flex. I think they've got to pivot in terms of what they're currently offering and maybe come more into a, a retail environment where customers can actually have a hybrid model, not just a complete online model. Uh, if you look at the likes of because you, today's, the today's warning, there's lots of people jump on it because of their online only model, but it's not just kazoo. If you look at um, in the States, you've got Carvana, which are experiencing very similar issues. Um, if you look back in the UK last year, where we had the collapse of Carzam um, as an online world, lots of people talked about it was a stock issue. And I don't think it's just stock. Mm -hmm. I think there's a number of factors which are actually influencing the, the actual model and the, and the way that they trade is changing. Uh, interestingly, if you look in the UK marketplace, uh, we've got a company called Motorpoint, who's a, a traditional used car supermarket. Um, they've had growth over years and years and years. I think they've now got something like 17 sites uh, in different major cities across the UK. Yet in COVID, they've pivoted their business to be an online business. 73% mm -hmm. of their turnover and their actual um their revenue came from an online channel, and mm -hmm. that was in their 1920 account. Um, last year in the accounts revenue, they increased the revenue by 83%, yet mm -hmm. that online percentage dropped to 56% of their business. So they're seeing very much the fact that people still want to touch, see, and feel the cars. And I think that's maybe where these online disrupts have to pivot. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll throw that back to you guys and see what you think. What, what was your thoughts, Darren? Well, well a, a question first for you, Andrew. Um, the numbers, for again, people listen to this. Uh, I understand uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, um, Kazoo had a valuation to start with of, what was it, $6.5 billion. Uh, as of this morning, the market cap. Uh, Andrew, what was the market cap based um, on? This, this morning, uh, the, the shares were trading at $0.18, cents, making about $117 million. 
Well, that's some sort of slide, though, isn't it? Six point five billion down to one hundred and seventeen. And um, again, firstly, I'm no stock market genius, but how did the valuation six point five come out there? Was it ever worth that? Uh, Darren, what do you use there? Uh, well, I definitely think there's, um, you know, you, you know, Andrew was just talking about Carvana, um, and that's a, a more mature example, if you like, in the marketplace. And I think the interesting stat that, that that I always come back to with that is the amount of people that actually pass through the process without interfacing with somebody. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of attraction there. It's for those that don't know, it's, you know, almost picking up your car out of a vending machine. And they, mm. they certainly play that part very well. And you kind of there's the kudos of doing the actual process. But the vast majority of people still want to touch and feel some part of that that um, process with a human being. Um, and so the, the, the number that physically transacts all the way through is absolutely tiny initially. The number, I say you know, roughly, well. you know, roughly the number. I want to say it's a while ago since I got um, the latest figures, but originally it was 5% of people that actually would go through without actually speaking to somebody and, you know, touch and, you know, um, interact, if you like, with a human being. So, you know, COVID will undoubtedly have pushed those those numbers. Um, scared stock will have undoubtedly pushed those numbers as people sort of, you know, buy whatever that they, 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 they could that was available. But it actually appeared as one of the businesses where um, the inve- the original assessment and valuation of it is somewhere in the region of 100%. I think it was 99% reduction in the value of those shares from the initial valuation that it was achieving. So right, it's like a, effectively is that, halved. Is that Kazoo that you're talking about now or you're talking no, about Carvana, Carvana this is in America? Carvana in the States, yeah. Um, and they were looking at, you know, it's not just our business. There's all sorts of businesses where there's some of those big names that have come in and disrupted the marketplace. So there were things like Peloton in there. Mm-hmm. There was um, uh, Beyond Meat, you know, which is, um, you know, a, an option for um, vegans and um, food wise. So, you know, it's across every single industry that there's a kind of disruptor that comes in and, and introduce something new into that marketplace. So, um, but interesting enough, quite a few of these businesses, you know, roar away, but actually come back to more of a natural, what I would say is more of a natural position in the marketplace. And I, and I think genuinely the people who will succeed are those that cater for an omni-channel approach. Mm-hmm. You know, there will be some people that start their journey online and want to go long way into the process before they touch and interact with somebody. There'll be other people that will come in without possibly even having a look on the internet they're in the minority but there might still be a few of those and it's going to be that a process that can take those interactions and bring them all together you know did it start off as a facebook inquiry did it then move to an online email did it then you know end up with a telephone call and at every stage anybody could join that that sort of purchase decision and the true you know business that capitalizes on it will be the ones that commit you know make sure that they cater for all of those channels and put them into a uh, a process that that you know effectively people want to deal with people they want the trust the human being at some point it's just at different points that they might want to act, interact do they want to interact right at the start or do they want to interact once they've purchased you know there's there, there's that will be the, the real acid test, I think, going forward are those that can cater for those different requirements from a customer's needs. I don't think any one of those routes will in itself be the, the holy grail. I think it will definitely be a, being able to cater for a mixture of all of those channels. Now, so, Andrew, coming back to you, you said that supply issues it definitely sounds like it's hit uh, Kazoo and Carvena. You said before, though, and I cut you off, but you don't think it's just supply. How much do you think their valuations is because they can't get stock? In the UK, I've noticed that uh, Kazoo was saying, uh, we'll buy your car as well. Um, and the reason why I ask that, Cinch obviously has uh, access to stock through their Marshalls organization. They own We Buy and Car, uh, BCA Auctions. Uh, you think, is it stock that's really created these, these disruptors to have the valuation issue? Uh, I'm, I'm, again, go back to I'm not 100 sure it is. If you look at Kazoo, if you look at the acquisitions made since 2020, they've actually gone and bought 
uh, leasing businesses, they've gone fleet suppliers. They've invested hundreds of millions of pounds and make sure they protect their supply chain mm. so they've got lots of cars come to end of agreements things like zip car they, they've got lots of different small leasing I mean, the, the cars have gone out on the daily market they're coming back into uh, kazoo to protect that supply chain now supply chain if you go back to the tesco days was that about 10 11 years ago when tesco tried to disrupt the market uh, it was i think oh, 12 months i think to the day they lasted yeah now they had major major supply issues they were getting supplied cars from, I believe, lease plan. So every car that's coming to the end of a lease plan agreement was then being marketed through Tesco's. Now, if you can think about their, the data that they have under the Tesco Club Card, the access to the amounts of names and addresses in the UK marketplace where they can market those cars to, it's phenomenal. Mm. They, they've got more than these new disruptors have got. Yet they couldn't make it work because they didn't have the supply. And that's why 12 months of the day, they actually pulled the chain on it. Mm. But they could only supply Ford predominantly and Vauxhall. They were missing out the Volkswagen, the BMW, mm. the Audis, the cars that people have an aspiration to buy. They just didn't have access to. So for them, it was supply. With Kazoo, I think it's a little bit different. Mm. I think it's the inflexible, to go back to what Darren mentioned, that omni-channel. If they have the flexibility for customers to touch, see, and drive the car, I think that could drive their strength massively. Because... Mm. It's not all down to supply for kazoo. Now, I think Carvana could be different in the States. Mm. I've had the I've massive benefit of visiting a, a Carvana site back in October. Mm -hmm. It's out in Richmond in the States. And the guy, the general manager of the site, he mentioned that supply was an issue out there. Um, mm. If you looked at their tower, their tower, uh, it was a brand impressive. New yeah. Unbelievable. But it was half full. Wow. And that's goes against the grain of everything that they want. They want to be having, it mm. goes back to saying that the shelves are stacked with everything, they'll sell more. And I think that's where Carvana are having problems. I think Kazoo's slightly different in the UK. Um, go back to our training courses. You know, we sit with guys week in, week out in car dealerships and different environments with manufacturers. I ask the question all the time, would you buy a car from start to finish online to people who work in the industry? You know, we mm. deal with these transactions day in, day out. Fascinatingly, more than half people just wouldn't do it. They just wouldn't do it. They want to see, touch, and drive it before they make that decision. And I think that is the, the biggest problem we're going to have to face. As we're coming out of COVID, people want to buy from people again. I think there has to be that cross mix. Go back to motor points. If their revenue is driven by 83% growth in the last financial year, and that's been driven by face-to-face -face contacts and people going into their business and buying cars, mm -hmm. they still have a very strong online channel, and they still supply a lot of cars that way. But their growth and their profit increases come by that face-to-face -face contact. So mm. there has to be room in the market for what Darren mentioned as an omni-channel where there can be all sorts of mix. It can't just be one channel. So, Darren, we see this again and again. These disruptors come in there. Um, when I first come over, it was Daewoo in 95 and those slating dealers. Um, Tesco's 12 months, Andrew was saying, to the day and they come out of the market. Richard Branson, um, I believe that was with DC Cook. He did something with them there. Yeah. Um, th th there's lots of these disruptors that came in. Okay. Do they all think what we do is so easy? They look from the outside. I mean, Alex Chestman in the Sunday Times turned around and said, we dealers, we're all sheepskin coats wearing Arthur Daily characters. It was quite derogatory to our industry. The question I have is, do these guys see our industry think it's a lot easier than it actually is? I think that's natural. I think, you know, even people who join the industry come in and expect it to be a lot easier industry than it actually is. You know, particularly as a salesperson, you'll get that kind of theory that all I've got to do is look after a customer, you know, help them out, be really polite. And, and all of a sudden I'll sell a car. So, you know, th there is definitely a complexity that is in the industry. What I love about these people that come in from outside is they shake the industry up they mm. keep us on our toes competition is healthy you know mm. if we don't have competition we become complacent so it's certainly they every single person who comes brings something to the market i remember you know when you start really thinking about it there was jamjar.com as well so yeah. you know there's a huge amount of these people that have come along over the time and done their own sort of thing um, some of those have branched out as well and tried to retail themselves mm. their own stock and so there's always bits and pieces going on in the marketplace but 
you know, from my perspective, I'm always concentrating on not being the best car dealership. I'm looking at being the best as a retailer mm. because actually the time that we have with a customer is often, you know, once every two or three years in sales and possibly once every 12 months. And even that's slipping back now with an after sales customer or a customer coming into service. So actually the what happens for the balance of that 12 months shapes their behavior of and their expectations in the retailing environment and you know things like in uh you'd be in a supermarket and the queue dissolves in front of you because they've called a load of operators onto the checkout to smooth out those um th those queues and make sure people are dealt with quickly that has a knock-on effect on the expectations perhaps of a customer walking in and wanting to speak to somebody quicker um, we have had some mad things happen. You know, recently we've had situations with um, supply being actually strangled in certain things. I can remember cement going for £20 a bag of cement that mm. would normally be a £5 bag of cement and customers being limited to maybe three or four purchases yep. if they had anything. So, you know, we've seen things that we never saw before. We wouldn't expect to go into a shop and not have availability of something that we wanted to purchase but we're seeing that now happen. So um, these are all things that shape the way that we deal with the market in ourselves. You know, we've certainly seen an influx in, in dealerships where it's not, you know, um, if you want that car, you've got to pay that price. That's the price that it is. There's no negotiation. And, and lots of dealerships have benefited from that period of restricted supply. We're moving through that. We will recover from where we've been and we will get back to that situation where people will buy not just on the availability of something, but based on the experience and that journey that they've had. And in true retailing, people actually enjoy the experience or they should enjoy the experience. You know, every year people travel to markets and things like that in different countries. You know, Bologna would be a good example of people who go over there just for the way the retailing experience, you know, you purchase something from there, it's gift wrapped. It's all, you know, there's a lovely element, a lovely enjoyment part of going in and actually making that purchase. And it's the same quite often for a dealership. You know, lots of dealerships have customers that trade with that dealership and have done for many many years because that relationship is so solid mm. um, so i you know i welcome people coming into the marketplace of course you're going to see it with rose tinted spectacles like we all would looking at somebody else's industry but um you know the the upshot of that is it gives us all a shot in the arm to go well, actually could we do some things better than we're doing mm. are we just doing what we've always done well a andrew the disruptors I want to uh, explore that now. Are they really the disruptors? What can they do that a traditional car dealership can't do? Um, that's the bit that sometimes I see this, um, the one that always makes me giggle, seven days you can return the car. Well, actually, the law says it's 14 days in the UK they return it anyway. So they're almost advertising we're half as good as what your deal are. Uh, are they really the disruptors, Andrew? I don't think they are. I think their model, I think uh, one of the slogans for Cinch is, is it cars without the faff? Mm -hmm. that They're trying to sell on that stereotypical car sales. They're going back into, I think it almost where Alex Chesterman came from. You know, we are all Arthur Daly type characters. And now they're playing on that uh, stereotype for customers to think they're going to get a better deal mm -hmm. by shopping online, cutting out the hassle, no faff and trying to make a transaction rather than an emotional purchase. Mm -hmm. And genuinely, I think maybe because of COVID, we had to go down that transactional route. Mm -hmm. But isn't buying, it's the second biggest purchase of most people will ever, ever buy. And it isn't a lot of it about emotions rather than just transaction. It's not a business purchase. It's something that they're going to drive, they're going to live with. It's become part of the family. It's part of most people's data symbols. There's a lot of aspirational ownership behind buying a car. So actually by taking it into this disruptor model and going online are we missing all that is that why kazoo's uh last year their average profit per unit was i believe stated at 147 pounds per unit wow say that number again for me 147 One? pounds per unit wow okay profit per unit. Now, and then the car's delivered uh up to aberdeen uh, down to Exeter for the people listening to this in the States. That's um, I know it's very close for you. Okay. People in Australia, you know, that's just around the corner, but that's a big old journey. What What's that going to cost you to get a car 
delivered to Aberdeen from London. It's what is it? It's three hundred, four hundred. Five hundred, no, a bit more. Yeah, five hundred pounds to do that. Now that's probably taking into consideration all the costs. That one four seven. Um, yep. you know, that probably is their net, net, net. But still, if you think when he set his business model up, mm. Alex Chesson came out to they want to make three thousand pounds per unit. Wow, I didn't know that. Three thousand. That was that was his quarter. They revised that for twenty one, twenty two, to fourteen hundred pounds, and they're still missing that by a huge, huge mark. Did he actually say they want to make three thousand pounds? Yep. Per unit they sold used cars. That was something I read in Automotive Management this morning. I believe that was actually in the Times. Wow, wow! I, I tell you what, if you're looking for investors, um, I suppose it's great just to say, uh, um, listen, this is what we're going to do. But wow, three thousand, three thousand pounds a used car. Uh, unless he was planning to stock it just with a Ferrari and Land Rover, maybe. Um, that just seems an incredible amount, incredible aspirations. Some of them may have come unstuck as well. And we've certainly seen this where the original model was completely online and we've seen a diversification into having to go into methods of acquiring stock yeah. because that's become a problem. We've seen um, having to actually go into physical buildings because we need to be able to, you know, uh, prepare that stock. And mm -hmm. so some of these, the, these um, I think, costs may not have been factored in right from the start because most of these disruptors have now bought in so that they're a combination of clips and bricks, not just the online model that perhaps it was portrayed right at the start or certainly the, the sort of impression was there. And they may have been in there plans but that may be also part of why there's a you know a, a, a big difference in actually what, what they're making versus what they what they intended to make I, I spoke to a deal this morning uh one of our clients guys and they'll be listening to this and we had the conversation just because of the um the new york stock exchange if you listen to this down the track there uh currently they've just stopped the rights now i'm no I don't understand the stock market that well, but I understand that the New York Stock Exchange has not suspended the shares. They suspended the rights. Now, my understanding of that is if they have an employee that has the rights to buy the shares at 50 cents, uh, they're currently trading at $10, say, they can buy that in the future. And the New York Stock Exchange has stopped the rights to buy that. So instead of giving the employee shares in the business at that point, they have the rights to those uh, in the future. Um, again, someone's going to write and say, no, you've got that wrong. And I probably have. OK, but they've definitely suspended the rights, which is has to be very concerning for public sentiment. Um, uh, why are they doing that? What's the next step? But speaking of this dealer, he said, ah, Alex Chessman, bit of a genius, though, isn't he? I said, really? Have you not seen the news this morning? He said, nah. What did Alex Chessman want to do? OK, what he's done is. OK, he's just built this great idea about all this profit this place can make, um, floated it for a time's earnings that was like ridiculous because they weren't making any profit. Um, and he's already bailed out. He's not been around the company for a long time, apparently. I don't know that for certain. OK, but that's what this dealer is saying. How much has he parachuted out with already? Um, could be the case. Could be the case. Where does that leave the others, though? The cinches of the world, Andrew. Um, I know you don't believe stock is the only issue, okay? But they do have all these other people. Are they stronger, do you think? Or could we see the same issue with cinch? Um, I've, I've got to say, I, the cinch model is an interesting one. If, if you look, they can take... We, we talk about stock not being the issue because... Mm. It, Cinch will take uh, prime stock from British car auctions. They'll take prime stock from webuyanycar.com. Uh, any car that doesn't match that then goes back through the, the auction model. So we kind of know what that keeps that part going. They've got the, the part of uh, Marshall Motor Group's part of it. So you've got the franchise network, you've got all the part exchanges, you've got lots of cars coming through that way. Um, but they also advertise other people's stock. You can advertise them since your own stock as a car dealer. Mm. It's not just since just stock. So actually their stock holding, I think at any one time, is something like 4,000 available cars at any one time. So actually their offerings, massive. Uh, linked to some of the best finance deals um, and a very strong marketing campaign. They don't seem to be being affected in the same way that the other guys have. But Andrew, you... so, sorry to cut you off. For people listening to this in Australia, uh, in Ireland, um, the Canadian market, um, can you just run through how the cinch, the whole 
business model was they'd say to a, a franchise dealership through BCA auctions, uh, buy this car through the BCA auction, let us advertise it for you. We'll give you the profit there. And then if it doesn't sell in 60 days, then it's yours. And uh, can you just explain how that worked? And were they since not just using the dealers as a bank to fund the stock? Can you just run through how that, that concept worked? Yeah, and Simon, I'm not 100% sure on the, the actual model behind Cinch. Um, I do know that they were described almost like a bro an advertising broker at one point, but they were advertising other dealer stock. Um, they had to fit certain criteria for preparation, photograph standards, um, but their stock holding was negligible compared to their advertised stock. Yeah, okay. uh, but they were pulling the best stock from the British car auction. So mm -hmm. as a business model, they were taking the prime cars. Mm -hmm. uh, we Bandy Car, um, who are one of the biggest car buying websites in the whole of the UK, so they, they buy lots and lots of stock in. If the car matches the criteria, they go into cinch stock holding. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they then go through the auction for other retailers to buy. Uh, they then have one of the UK's largest motor dealer groups with a, a massive array of different franchises. And they get all their part exchange offerings as well. So there's just such a huge um, availability of stock for Cinch to pull from. And it's not all physical stock that they own, uh, but they will market it, they will sell it, and then they'll pay the, the dealer for, for having the car on there. So the, there is a their route is slightly different to Kazoo, but as a retail customer, if you go on their website, you just believe you're dealing with yep. Cinch. Um, and I think they are classed as the third most recognizable used car retail it now in the uk um so and i think they've, they've got about three to four percent market share now who's the guy with the big white teeth that i see all the time on tv who was that man um advertising all the time for cinch um it'll come right ah oh, right i knew darren would know okay <laughs> darren would know who that was um yeah i i suppose what these people have had is lots of advertising revenue in the uk market kazoo's of the world the center of the world um, were there two football teams, Darren, that Kazoo sponsored? Not just one, was it two? Uh, I, I think you see their name popping up in all sorts of things. Yeah, definitely there's some Premier League football teams in there. Um, I think there's um, uh, some elements of cricket as well, I think, that their names popped up in. I'm not sure. I think Cinch is definitely on cricket as well. Um, you know, there, there, there's some serious marketing and um, name awareness out there for for, for all of those brands um, and, no, and no doubt you know having a massive effect on the um, the, the bottom line as well but um, I, th I think it's necessary for those sorts of businesses to continue a, a sort of high profile spend as well um, you know when you don't have that ongoing kind of um, you know, most of our, our dealers, if you like, have marketing and advertising that comes from the manufacturer that keeps that going. They have local awareness. They're operating in a specific area. If you don't have that, you've got to go national and you've got to go presumably fairly big on it. So I don't see it changing over a period, but it, uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to sign the, the bills off for that one. Sponsoring a premiership football team. Uh, that can't be the cheapest thing in the world, I'm guessing. No. Uh, it, it's got to be a big one. So yeah, um, but they've, they've, they've sponsored Aston Villa and Everton are the two clubs which Kazoo are, are sponsoring. So maybe next year it might be a little bit cheaper. <laughs> they might be. <laughs> they might be looking at. Um, I, I don't know enough about football as you two would know. Um, so um, maybe a, a a crew Alexander is that a football team? Did, did <laughs> I just did, did I just guess that one? Maybe, maybe so. Um, so listen, ra wrapping this up. You're a dealer listening to this. We know that most of our audience are dealers, um, dealer group, owners of dealer groups, uh, manufacturers as well. We get more and more manufacturers listening to this. If you're a traditional dealer, what would you be focusing on over the next 12 months? I'm going to ask both you guys, okay? Um, because one thing I'm thinking, if one of these disruptors do fold, and while you listen to this, they might well do. Oh, I actually haven't said that. If it's worth 117 million, is the case where someone Alex Chessman buys them back off them? I, I, I don't know enough about that. Um, but if you're a dealer, okay, and some of these disruptors do fold, what would you be focusing on, just specific to used cars over the next 12 months? And I'll start that conversation with uh, you, Darren. Um, I, I think for me, um, the really important. Um, concentration I would put on on a, on a site now is in my own territory, 
So I want to be, you know, uh, renowned in my own territory as the place to come. I would look to get that message out there through my Google reviews Mm -hmm. so that I have a strong presence so that when people search, if you look already now and you go on and search for a hotel room in a particular area, you'll find a correlation between the facilities that that hotel offers versus the um the other hotels that are out there but then you'll see them stacked based on how their google reviews are and what i mean by that is somewhere that might not have great facilities but has a 4.8 4.9 rating where everybody's raving about it will be charging more money than perhaps somewhere that maybe has you know, a a leisure club attached to it, but it's a little bit tired. It's a little bit run down. It's not quite good a surface that's there and it's only got a 4.1 or whatever. You'll see the price of those very comparable. So you can already see that actually people are looking at those reviews and basing how much they're prepared to pay based on the the experience of other people. So I think that that's certainly somewhere I would very much look to because it's very visual as an online window. Um, I'd look at the journey that people were going on because it was right in the past. Is it right now? Do we cater for people joining at different part places in that process? You know, or are we still trying to cram them and ram them through the, the old process that works best for us? Um, I also think there'll be a lot more focus on getting back to functioning as we did as a dealership. As stock recovers, as there becomes more and more opportunity out there um, for um dealerships to you know get the stock that they can sell if you like then we need to get back to those those skills that we had before which mean that people want to come and trade with us uh, and move away from those that period that we had where just because we had the car we were pretty much guaranteed the business and that business would be full up without you know actually having to to deploy much of a sales skill or, or skill or ability over that period so so that would be my real focal points moving forward for um 2023 um and the 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 final point on that from a sales perspective is there's going to be a real key here to selling the the people that you've got coming through the door if we can sell a little bit more to each of those that's really where the profitability will come from um because you're going to be in that situation where you may still have limitations so once you've got a customer there that enjoys your service wants to trade with you that focal point on the ancillary bits that you do and perhaps some of the other services that you could offer you know like balloting people's cars while they're in for service and that sort of thing could all be quite potentially good earners moving forward um and also give you a a a reputation and a name in the community so and Andrew, what will you do focusing dealer listening to this now over the next month for uh, 2023? Yeah, for me, it's it's got to be the ability to stand out online, which sound, might sound ridiculous. You've got these big disruptors who are taking the marketplace. But do you know what? When that inquiry comes to your business, for me, it's how we handle that and we put the human element into it. If we can stand out online and give the customer the feeling that we want to transact with them, that we want the business, and that we're open and willing for that little bit of negotiation, uh, we can drive more people back into our showrooms than not. There's too many times when that inquiry comes in, it's, ah, it's just another inquiry. It's just another waste of inquiry. If people start on the journey online because of the kazoos and because of the cinches, they're not going to get looked after how we would look after people in the traditional dealer network. And actually, if we handle the inquiry right at the outset and really engage with that customer online, I think that can make the difference in 2023. I think that can help drive our profitability. It can drive our um, conversion from inquiry into footfall, into showroom, into demonstration drive. And that comes from having the right staff and having engaged staff who want to deal with those people online. And, And for me, that makes a difference. Let's go back to it. At the end of the day, and Chester misses this, people buy from people. Yeah. And that's what we've got to do. We've got yeah. to get back to that. I, I, again, I, I agree with 100. People buy for people. And this is my own little personal um, frustration with dealers and uh, some of the clients that we deal with as well. We love the See It Now videos, okay? The image consoles, whatever you use in your country there. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. We love them. I love these rapid response programs. It makes it quick and easy for a salesperson to deal with that response, that inquiry that comes through. And they're so good. However, they need to be customized. 
so often on our training um we, we might do a mystery shop and we know straight away the video will come through well we all think videos come through all the time let me tell you they don't they really don't but when they come through i can almost tell you the wording to start with rather than a few photographs i prepared a personal video presentation of the car it's an option to see the car in more detail and for me to introduce myself personally you, you know the words there that needs to be changed because if that person sends an inquiry just to you as a dealer they haven't sent it just to you they sent it to what six ten other places and they all have the same response. I mean, I, I, we can tell you when rapid response has been into a dealer uh, or a dealer group or a manufacturer, okay, because they use the same standard templates. And I just believe customers can smell a template a mile off. They need to personalize it, personalize it, personalize it. Because, Andrew, I think you're dead right. People buy people. Um, they really will. So, guys, I just want to say thank you very much for the first uh, podcast of 2023. A uh, bit of a different one today, putting the world to right. Uh, but I quite enjoy this, talking about uh, what's happening out there. So um, anything else either of you would like to add to this? No, just a, a big thank you from me. Thank you. Yeah. And not to sound like the two Ronnies, a big thank you to me as well. <laughs> very good. Guys, thank you very much. We'll see you again. That just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.